All right, and welcome everybody to this seventh lesson in our series of lessons on shock. In this lesson, we're going to continue our discussion of the various types of distributive shock, specifically covering neurogenic shock. And my name is Eddie Watson. I will be your presenter for this series of lessons. And make sure and subscribe to our channel below in order to stay up to date on when our latest lessons are released. And don't forget to hit the bell icon in order to get those notifications as those lessons become available. All right, so for this lesson, we're going to take a look at our neurogenic shock. Again, another type of shock that is classified as a distributive shock. So like with all the rest of them, we're going to go ahead and break down our word into its root words. So we have neuro and genic. Neuro having to do with the brain and spinal cord. And genic meaning originating from. And so in our case here, our shock state is going to be the result of some sort of CNS injury. And so the CNS injury is going to be the result of some sort of cervical or high thoracic. And so this is going to be T6 and above. So some sort of injury to the spinal cord at at least the T6 level or higher. And so what happens when we have a spinal cord injury at this level or higher is if there is some sort of impact on the sympathetic nerve outflow, that this is going to have a, an impact on things in our body that can lead to a state of shock. So essentially, they'll find themselves in a state with, with no sympathetic response, but still a preserved parasympathetic response or activity. And so what does this really mean for our patients? Well, this is going to impact our coronary vessels. So again, if we think about that sympathetic response, that fight or flight, normally we get that dilation of the coronary blood flow. But in the case of neurogenic shock, we're not going to see that. Now also, since we're not going to have our sympathetic activation, we're also going to see a decrease in our systemic vascular resistance, or essentially our afterload. And again, if you think back to our first lesson in this series, we have the release of the catecholamines from the adrenal gland, which ultimately bind with receptor sites in our blood vessels and work to cause vasoconstriction. But again, in neurogenic shock, we're not going to have this cascade of events, ultimately leading to decreased vascular tone. And since our systemic vascular resistance plays an important role in our blood pressure, we are going to see that decreased blood pressure. Now we also see this sympathetic nerve innerviating the heart itself, and one of the things that it does there is it has that positive inotropic effect, and so since we don't, again, have that, we're going to see a decrease in our cardiac contraction. Now in addition to our decreased systemic vascular resistance, this means we're, we're not going to be getting blood back to the heart as well as we should, so this is going to lead to a decrease in our preload. And finally, one of the most telltale signs of neurogenic shock is we no longer are innerviating the SA node of the heart, and we're no longer getting that positive chronotropic effect of the sympathetic response. And so what happens is you will see a low heart rate in your patient. And so really, if we think about all the factors that go into our cardiac output, we're having an impact on all of those. We're decreasing our preload, decreasing our afterload, decreasing our contractility and also decreasing our heart rate. And so this combination of all of these impacted areas and our lack of sympathetic response is going to lead to a low blood pressure. Another thing that we also could see in our patients with neurogenic shock is hypothermia. But one important thing to note about this is this is going to be in the patient's core. And this is due to a dysregulation within the hypothalamus. But again, if you think about our lack of sympathetic response, we are not getting that vasoconstriction that often leads to the cool, clammy skin. And so we'll talk about that here in a minute, but our patient will be exhibiting this, this hypothermia within the body. And so one thing that's really important to note when we're looking at possibly diagnosing a patient with neurogenic shock is it's really important that we rule out all others. 
So it's really important that we rule out all other possible causes of shock before we make the determination that this is a result of a neurogenic shock state. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to talk about some of the signs that we would see if we had a patient in neurogenic shock. So as always, we're gonna see that decreased blood pressure or hypotension, and this is gonna be a result of that decreased systemic vascular resistance. Now, one of the telltale signs for neurogenic shock is that normally our body would attempt to compensate for this blood pressure by activating the sympathetic response and increasing our heart rate and our vasoconstriction. But in this case, we no longer have that ability. So you're going to find your patient with a decreased heart rate or bradycardia. And along with that, you're often going to see a decreased cardiac output as well as a decrease in our CVP or our pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And again, this is a result of that lack of preload of the blood not making its way back. And finally, like we just talked about, you may also see hypothermia. But unlike in other shock states with this hypothermia, you're actually going to have warm, dry extremities. All right, so now let's go ahead and move on to our treatment. And so when we look at our treatment modalities for a patient in neurogenic shock, probably the first and most important thing that we need to make sure we do is we need to protect the spine. And this is very important because while oftentimes the damage to the spine may not be reversible or fixable, sometimes it may be or they may be able to partially recover some function. And so it's imperative that we do not cause even more damage. And this is where we're going to use things like keeping their bed flat, using a C-collar, and also log rolling your patient. And so now with neurogenic shock, our first line of treatment is actually going to be IV fluids, and we're going to look to replace that intravascular volume. And so essentially, we want to be able to provide more volume of blood in order to fill all the extra space that now exists within the vasculature. Now, if the patient's symptoms persist and they remain persistently hypotensive, then the next thing we're going to be looking at doing is using our vasopressors. And this is going to provide the body with that vasoconstriction that our patient is just not able to produ produce themselves. But we might also look at medications like our inotropes. And for these, we're looking to make up for that lack of contractility, again, that we're not receiving as a result of this lack of sympathetic response. Now, if your patient remains with a hemodynamically significant bradycardia, then we may also want to look at ways of increasing our heart rate. So we may try medications like dopamine, which can have a dual effect on both increasing our heart rate as well as providing that vasoconstriction. We also often will look at a medication called atropine. And this medication works to increase our heart rate by actually blocking the parasympathetic response which in the case of neurogenic shock is the overriding response that our body has right now. And finally, you may also look at options such as pacing your patient, and this can be both externally or internally. And so with these interventions like the fluids and the pressors and the inotropes and working to increase their heart rate, we're going to really want to make sure that we're maintaining a higher mean arterial pressure than we normally would look in normal patients. And the reason for this is we're going to want to be ensuring that we're providing adequate spinal cord perfusion. And due to the result of the injury and the swelling that's going on in the spinal cord, we're going to have to have a higher map in order to overcome the increased pressure and increased swelling in order to perfuse that spinal cord. And finally, the last thing that we may need to look at doing for our patients is we are going to want to be looking at protecting their airway. And now this may come about as a result of being in a shock state, but also oftentimes, depending on how high the level of the spinal cord injury, that this could have an impact on respiratory accessory muscles, as well as the direct innervation of the diaphragm itself, possibly leading to respiratory failure for your patient requiring intubation and mechanical ventilation. All right, so that just about covers our discussion of neurogenic shock. As you can see, the shock is quite a bit different than some of the other ones that we've talked to up to this point. And so we really kind of talked about 
what's going on and what's really causing those differences and how those differences are leading to that shock state. In addition, we talked about some of the signs that you'd see in your patient and finally covered some of the courses of treatment that we had in place specifically for patients with neurogenic shock. And so on that note, uh, I do want to thank you for watching this lesson. I really do hope that you found this useful for you. If you did like the video and you found it informative, make sure and hit that like button down below as it really helps to spread the word about our channel. Also in the comments below, tell us your favorite part of this video or feel free to ask any questions that you might have. Finally, make sure and check out the next lesson in this series on septic shock or also check out another one of our great series of lessons on hemodynamics. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next lesson.